welcome to Makaya World Reviews. You know who I am, the Eternal Makaya, Master of Minds and of Men. We're at the very end, the very end of our look at prison movies for November, I guess into December now. Uh, now, I could have picked lots of films, and arguably the one I picked isn't really a prison film. Um, it's about a man being locked up, and he can't get out, so I consider it a prison, so whatever. Plus, I wanted a reason to rewatch this movie, so today we're going to be looking at one flew over the cuckoo's nest. I wanted to end on a big one. So go ahead and hit subscribe. Do it now. And let's see if we can lift that water console. One Flew of the Cuckoo's Nest, directed by Milos Forman. Really interesting guy that had some hits, at least critically like this one, The Fireman's Ball, Amadeus, then some abject failures despite being ambitious, like People vs. Larry Flint, and Man on the Moon. And lots of non-starters. A shame he wasn't able to make more before his passing. Not that he doesn't have something of a legacy. Written, uh, this was based on a book by Ken Casey. I'm a big Ken Casey fan, having read a number of his works, as well as the awful Electric Kool-Aid Acid Test about him following, uh, about following Ken, following his release from the mental hospital, where he was inspired to write this book. He generally liked the film, and I'm always happy to hear a writer enjoying an adaptation, even if it wasn't perfect in their eyes. Starring Jack Nicholson, I have to tell you who Jack Nicholson is. Cocaine aficionado. He was the Joker. He was an easy rider. He was the devil. He's been president and gangsters and werewolves and teamsters. The man is a legend. And Louise Fletcher, a woman who really made her role as Nurse Ratched her own, her own in this and will forever be synonymous with it. But she's had an insanely long career, especially on the TV front, so she thankfully wasn't pigeon-held by this role. Release date for this was November 19th, 1975. What came out the same week? The story of O, oh, based on the famous Dasadian erotic novel of the same name, reading about, a, about as much subtext that a 1975 French pornographic film, as you can imagine. <laughs> Not that there was that much of the novel, to be frank. Udo Kier is in this, for what it's worth. And almost human, we go from French garbage to Italian garbage. I don't really know what the point was trying to be made by this nihilistic crap, but it exists. And it's there, and I talked about it, and I'll never have to talk about it again. Moving to the plot, we meet one Randall Patrick R.P. McMurphy, low-life criminal and all-around scoundrel. He has convinced the courts he was crazy, so he goes to the crazy house. Instead of jail on a statutory rape conviction, and then we meet a cavalcade of colorful characters, such as snotty closeted man Dale Harding, young, sweet, stuttering Billy Bibbit, melodramatic Charlie Cheswick, the large, silent Chief Bromden, and other oddballs such as Max Tabor and Martini. Martini is my favorite. As, and also we meet the cold, callous, manipulative nurse Ratched, who asserts her dominance over the place with an even temper and spiteful heart. This is where the conflict begins, the immovable object versus the unstoppable force. As these two lifelong manipulators sway the band of supposed crazies to one side or the other, Murphy has the ability to get everyone riled up, excited, and becomes increasingly disruptive. He runs a gambling ring, makes bets on lifting a marble water table, and sits on watching the World Series. He even gets Billy, the Chief, and Chaswick as his merry band of men. Growing bored, he steals a bus and a boat. Taking the boys on a fishing trip, they have a great time. But of course, the cops and doctors are waiting for them at the dock. It's not long after McMurphy learns the harsh truth. His initial sentence doesn't matter. It's up to the nurse and doctors to actually approve of when he's let out. Well, this leads directly to an incident at the daily meetings, with McMurphy breaking a window and getting into a fight with the orderlies. Him, the chief, and Cheswick are all sent for electric shock therapy. Thankfully, the shock doesn't seem to do much to make Murphy's hands bring pain, annoyance, and show the inhumanity of the system. Well, that's just about enough for old R.P. McMurphy. He and the chief plan an escape. But naturally, he's not going out without a hell of a bang. He bribes the night guard with some booze and brings in some dirty broads for everyone to party with before him and the chief head off to Canada. Everyone has a good time drinking, flirting, and partying. Even Billy Bibbit loses his virginity. If things get away from them and Randall falls asleep after having a little bit too much to drink. Well, it's hell coming in the morning and Nurse Ratchet is on fire, admonishing everyone. And after she finds Billy in the arms of a woman, she berates him, bringing up his mother until he has a breakdown. He is taken to a room to calm down, but promptly commits suicide. Well, this is the very last straw as McMurphy attacks the nurse, almost choking the life out of her until he is stopped. Later, we see the ward back to somewhat normality, with Nurse Ratchet's power significantly diminished by her losing face against McMurphy and her voice not having quite the authority to it it used to. McMurphy is lobotomized, and when he is sent back down to the ward, the chief sees his friend a lifeless shell. He holds him and suffocates him, then grabs the water table McMurphy had tried to lift earlier, while well, the chief lifts it no problem, breaking through the window and escaping. Going to Canada, hopefully, 
in memory of his lost friend. All right, quite a heavy film. Let's talk about it. Directing and Cine, all on point here. We really only have a handful of different backdrops in this film, mostly in the walls of the hospital and the tight shots we get that give us a sense of claustrophobia that exists in a place like that, a sense of boxed in. We don't get a ton of two-person shots. It's a lot of talking head sort of things, and it works. We are, we are shut in. This singular thing is happening. The rest is mute and unimportant. The only time we really get expanded looks, the pullback, is on the boat where they are free and we see them all proud on this ship with their fish. The basketball scenes even feel tight, confined, uncomfortable. This also works with the nature of the hospital. We see the two floors of it. One where McMurphy and the pals muck about. And then there's the disturb board above them and it looks like a scene out of uh, Tactical Furis with people clearly suffering, afraid, sick, in pain, mentally ill, crawling about on the floor like, like animals, like bugs. This is all well done with nice, sharp cuts leading us from one scene to another. Um, simple, but very memorable. Speaking of memorable, I want to talk about the characters. Of course, we begin with R.P. McMurphy, an absolute unequivocal scumbag in every sense of the word, and e egotistical, loudmouth, manipulative, rapist, piece of shit. Despite all that, there's a charm to him that makes it incredibly hard to truly hate the man. Dislike, oh yes, easily, but hate, it's difficult. He seems to have some nuggets of gold in that heart of his, and, and it shows with his growing appreciation for the people around him. He starts off thinking he can manipulate these poor suckers, and boy howdy does he. But he ends up with this ever-increasing fondness for people like Cheswick, Bibbit, especially the Chief. Those two form a strong friendship we see in the movie, him getting the Chief to talk, to interact, to be a person again. He's a man who sees people's value and what they can do for him, but he's also a person who has feelings. He's complex. There's an ever-increasing faith in him by the boys, too. His leadership inspires many of them to rebel against the powers that be. Jack did an amazing job giving a lot of subtlety to this character that might not, might not have had it in anyone else's hands, you know? Moving on to Nurse Ratchet. Uh, there has been some debate. Is Nurse Ratchet evil? I don't know if evil is appropriate. She's a bureaucrat. She's maliciously compliant. She's coldly indifferent. She genuinely scares me because I've seen people like her in real life. Dead-eyed bureaucrats who abuse the minimal amount of power they have to maximize the abuse they do. Hell, just about every political you know, figure in the world has some of the nurse in them. She talks calmly, coolly, without emotion, without hesitation, but her words are barbs, foul jests. She uses therapy to abuse, humiliate, and dominate the people in her care. And her air of authority haunts the place, her timid assistant nurse cowering at her side, and a band of enforcers at her toe. Now one person in this movie feels comfortable with her, and her manipulation comes into conflict with McMurphy, who has his own plans, his own motives. While R.P. is a garbage can, he doesn't really want to actively hurt anyone, or control anyone except to get what he wants. He's a small man, a thug. She is a, something of a monster. While R.P. wants short-term pleasure, I imagine her torture gives her something of a thrill, however small it may be, and she will draw that out for as long as she can. In the end, she loses some of her power. Her voice weakened, her strength, thanks to R.P. Was his assault correct? I don't know. I'm not doing a debate on the morality of that. I understand it without condoning or condemning. Moving along to Billy Pivot. Billy doesn't have a huge role, but his importance is not to be understated. He's a sweet, sad boy who has a lot of issues to overcome, and he's in absolutely the wrong spot for it. The nurse and Billy's mother have some unknown friendship, and the nurse uses this to keep Billy docile while she embarrasses him regularly. In the end, the nurse pushes him too far. One last humiliation for poor Billy Bibbit, and he kills himself. And that scene is heartbreaking, sincerely heartbreaking. When you see that poor boy lying there and the rage McMurphy builds and builds and builds, he doesn't necessarily get to avenge Billy, but by God, he tries. To Chief Bromden, in the book, we see a little more of a complex and ill character, seeing great machines taking over the people around him. But perhaps he isn't wrong about that. Here, there is still a lot going on. At first, a lumbering giant, we are told, is deaf and dumb. And after he befriends R.P., he, talk, he talks, he jests, he plays. He has found a kin, someone who is alive in this place of cold machines. He longs to be free, to be away from it all. Him and R.P. are going to go to Canada, have fun. When he sees his friend lobotomized, he holds him cradles him. He knows this shell is not McMurphy. It's nothing. Another cog in this machine. He puts R.P. out of his misery. He escapes. And I hope he's free. <clears throat> Max Tabor and Dale Harding 
absolutely my favorite relationship in this movie. Christopher Lloyd and William Redfield, respectively, were both just hilarious. They fought like a married couple the only few times they interacted. Dale is clearly a closeted man and acts, Max eggs him on, but it's almost, it's not in a malicious way. It borders on making fun of a friend. I just wanted to mention how enjoyable these two bickering actually was. As for the rest, if Scatman Carruthers was fun in this as the night guard RP paid off in liquor, we know about five years later Jack would kill the Scatman in The Shining, so it's nice to see that. Martini, who's played by a young Danny DeVito, was fantastically silly in this, and he's always a joy. Uh, Charlie Cheswick was good as McMurphy's sidekick, and seeing him put faith in RP and grow as a person in strength is nice, but overall he's pretty annoying to listen to. Now, the movie, and especially the book, are a harsh commentary on the state of mental health in America, and it's depressing to think that very little has changed save the tools they use to subjugate you. Ken Casey did not enjoy his time in the mental health world of America, and he spoke about it eloquently in this novel. I myself have been through the machine in my own varied ways, and it, it still has a long way to go as far as compassion, understanding, and frankly, humanity in that. Take this movie as a warning, not a parable. Soundtrack is unique and interesting. Most of it kind of blends in appropriately, as a good soundtrack is wont to do. But when it stands out, namely the opening and closing theme, which are the same, comes off as this Native American circle band combined with some, like, folk rock. A perfectly fine and slightly odd soundtrack. Overall, this is objectively a great movie, and is often regarded as one for very good reason. It's got an excellent story, a fairly good pacing, and some interesting writing. But it's the characters, these iconic portrayals, that elevate this to another level. If you've not seen this movie, please take a time out of your day and watch it. It's easy to get something out of this movie, be it introspection or disgust, or something in between. It's absolutely 100% recommended. Well, that was the end of Prison Month, and what a big end did we go out on. What prison movie did I miss that you would like to see in a follow-up? Let me know down below. Also, add me on Instagram under Demon Peaks. Check out the Patreon where you can support this channel for as little as a buck. Subscribe. Come back next week where I'm, I'll be doing Christmas films, obviously, starting with Scrooged. Also, have a great day, have a great week, and thank you from the Tona Micaiah, Master of Minds and of Men. And goodbye. <laughs>